Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai, India. Hello citizens of the internet. In this second part of my e-lecture on contracted pelvis, I am going to discuss the investigations and management of CPD. Please watch part 1 before seeing this part. I have reserved the third and last part exclusively for the role of trial of labor in the management of borderline CPD, which is a topic by itself. Following investigations are done for confirming the diagnosis of CPD. External pelvimetry, internal pelvimetry, head fitting test, X-ray pelvimetry, cephalometry by ultrasonography and CT or MRI pelvimetry. I will discuss them one by one. Using body locks, thumbs, jarcos or crossing pelvimeter, the following external pelvic diameters were measured in the past. Interspinous diameter, which is the distance between two anterior superior iliac spines, external conjugate, intercrystal diameter, interrochantric diameter and intertuberous diameter. If the difference between the interspinous and intercrystal diameter is less than 2.5 cm or if the interspinous diameter is greater than the intercrystal diameter, then the diagnosis is rachitic pelvis. Intertuberous diameter is the only internal pelvic diameter that can be measured by the external pelvimeter. Please note that external pelvimetry is of little value as it measures diameters of the false pelvis. It is now obsolete. How common and therefore how important was bony dystocia as a cause of obstructed labor and consequent maternal and fetal morbidity and mortality in the old era of malnutrition and rickets can be judged by the famous quote of Ian Donald, inventor of ultrasonography. He said, every bride should have her pelvic measurements inscribed on the inside of her wedding ring. Clinical pelvimetry is the assessment of the inner dimensions and capacity of the adult female bony pelvis. I am not going into details of the same as I have already uploaded a full video on clinical pelvimetry. The link to my very popular video is given below in the description and at the end of the talk. Any one or more of the following findings are suspicious of contracted pelvis on clinical pelvimetry. Pelvic side walls are convergent, ischial spines are prominent, diagonal conjugate is less than 11.5 cm, Subcubic angle is less than 90 degrees, that is less than 3 finger breadths, or if sacrum is flat. Towards the end of the 19th century, Pinard, a French obstetrician, first introduced a method of abdominal palpation to estimate the relative size of the fetal head and the maternal pelvis. His method was later further improved by other stalwarts like Leopold. Muller, Mandrakar, and Enepurandre. Head fitting tests are done to detect contracted inlet if the head is not engaged in the last two to four weeks in a primary gavida. Of the more than 100 tests described, the best method is Muller and Kerr's test. I am going to describe it in detail. Patient is placed in dorsal position with thighs flexed and separated. The head is grasped by the left hand. Index and middle fingers of the right hand are inserted into the vagina up to the level of the ischial spines and the thumb of the same hand is placed above the symphysis pubis to note the degree of overlap. With the other hand, the head is pushed downwards and backwards. If the head can be pushed down up to the level of the ischial spines and there is no overlapping of the parietal bone over the symphysis pubis, there is no cephalopelvic disproportion. 
if the head can be pushed down a little but not up to the level of the ischial spines and there is a slight overlap of the parietal bones at the pubic symphysis it indicates mild or moderate disproportion if the head cannot be pushed down at all and instead the parietal bone overhangs the symphysis pubis displacing the thumb the diagnosis is severe disproportion following grades of contracted pelvis can be recognized during a head fitting test grade 0 the head can be pushed down into the pelvis without overlapping of parietal bone on the symphysis pubis there is no disproportion grade 1 head can be pushed into the cavity somewhat but the anterior surface of the head is in line with the inner border of pubic symphysis this is mild or borderline cpd if the head overrides the inner border of the pubic symphysis but not up to the outer border of the pubic symphysis then the diagnosis is moderate cpd when the head overrides the outer border of the pubic symphysis it indicates severely contracted pelvis this test has its limitations sometimes the degree of disproportion is difficult to detect because of deflexed head thick anti abdominal wall irritable uterus or a very high floating head head fitting test reminds me of a wonderful quote by manrokar author of operative obstetrics he said a well engaged head almost rules out contracted pelvis in a primary cavity as outlet contraction per se is very rare x-ray pelvimetry is another method of diagnosing contracted pelvis with the patient standing and with the x-ray tube on one side and the x-ray film on the opposite side two views of the abdomen and pelvis are taken erect lateral plate and antero posterior view as shown here a point to be noted is that because the x-ray is a point source some distance about 40 inches away from the x-ray plate and the image of the diameters ab projected on the plate gets magnified that is pq hence to get accurate measurement correction factor must be applied the formula is given here the actual diameter is always smaller than the measured diameter alternatively the correct measurements can be identified by using a graduated scale or thumbs perforated grid in which the perforations are 1 cm apart while taking the x-ray film the picture of the scale or the grid on the x-ray film allows direct measurement without applying correction factor the information gained from a an antero posterior view is as follows shape of the inlet transverse diameters of all the three planes shape and prominence of the ischial spines slope of the side walls subpubic angle and pelvic architecture and classification information gained from the lateral view is as follows ap diameter of all the three planes obstetric conjugate angle of pelvic inclination sacral angle sacral curve pseudo promontory if present angulation of fetal neck that is asynclitism and diagnosis of occipito posterior position needless to say that the lateral view is more important than the ap view because it gives more important information let me point out that in modern obstetrics there is hardly any place for routine use of x-ray pelvimetry in the antenatal period to predict the likelihood of a vaginal delivery x-ray pelvimetry as a predictor of obstetric outcome is considered as an obsolete procedure by modern obstetricians x-ray pelvimetry has fallen short of its expected clinical performance several articles have demonstrated its limited role in contemporary obstetric practice in the diagnosis of cephalopelvic disproportion besides assessing the maternal pelvis it is also important to ascertain 
the dimensions of fetal head. Ultrasonography is used to measure the bipartal diameter, occipitofrontal diameter and circumference of the fetal head. Suspect cephalopatic dysportion if bipartal diameter is greater than 10 cm. CT pelvimetry is superior to radio pelvimetry because it gives very precise images of the maternal pelvis and can measure pelvic diameters accurately and the radiation dose is one-sixth to one-third of the conventional X-ray pelvimetry that is about 44 to 425 millirads. In pregnancy however, CT is contraindicated and MRI imaging provides contrast resolution superior to that provided by CT. It provides high quality multiplanar imaging even in obese patients. MRI pelvimetry is however expensive and not routinely done. Besides the essential diameters of the pelvis which are judged by clinical pelvimetry or measured by X-ray pelvimetry, there are other immeasurable factors of overriding importance in labor like good uterine contractions that can push the head into the pelvis, molding of head which reduces diameters of fetal head, give of the pelvis that increases the pelvic diameters slightly and tone of pelvic flow and perineum which if pliable will facilitate vaginal delivery. It is the presence of these immeasurable factors which has made many obstetricians consider cephalopelvic disproportion as a retrospective diagnosis. It is also the reason why we can give a trial of vaginal delivery in a case of borderline contracted pelvis. Having measured the pelvic diameters accurately, the criteria for diagnosis are as follows. Inlet contraction, AP diameter of the inlet 9.5 to 10 cm indicates mild contraction. When the AP diameter is 8.5 to 9.5 cm, it indicates moderate contraction and if it is less than 8.5 cm, it indicates severely contracted pelvis. If the true conjugate is less than 6 cm, it is considered extreme degree of inlet contraction. In this situation, vaginal delivery is impossible even after craniotomy as the bimastroid diameter which is 7.5 cm is not crushed. It therefore requires cranioclasm that is crushing of the base of the skull to deliver the baby. Fortunately, we never encounter such cases in modern obstetrics. The formula used for diagnosing mid-pelvic contraction is as follows. Interspinous diameter plus the posterior sagittal diameter of the mid-pelvis less than 13.5 cm indicates mid-pelvic contraction. The formula for outlet contraction is intertuberous diameter plus the posterior sagittal diameter of the outlet less than 15 cm provided the posterior sagittal diameter is not less than 6 cm. This table summarizes the management of inlet contraction which depends mainly on the degree of disproportion. For mild that is borderline contracted pelvis a trial of vaginal delivery is given which I will discuss at length in the third part. For moderately contracted pelvis, sometimes a trial of labor is given, but if it fails, lower segment caesarean section is required. If the baby is dead, in the past, destructive operations were done. A severely contracted pelvis requires elective caesarean section to deliver the baby. If the baby is dead, a destructive operation can be performed. For a mild mid pelvic contraction, a trial of vaginal delivery can be given which can end with a forceps or vacuum extraction if necessary. A severe mid pelvic contraction however requires a caesarean delivery. For a mild outlet contraction, a generous episiotomy may suffice, but if it is severe, a caesarean delivery may be required. Indications for caesarean section in contracted pelvis are 
moderate disproportion if trial of labor is contraindicated or if it fails marked disproportion extreme disproportion whether the fetus is living or dead because reductive embryotomy is now more or less obsolete contracted outlet and contracted pelvis with other indications such as elderly prima gravida malpresentations or placenta previa other obsolete methods of management of contracted pelvis are symphysiotomy and induction of preterm labor in the past division of ligaments holding the pubic bones at the pubic symphysis was done to enlarge the available anterior posterior diameters of the pelvis it has no place in modern obstetrics although in certain parts of africa it is still done induction of preterm labor was frequently advocated in the past but has no place in current obstetric practice this is the end of part 2 of my e lecture on contracted pelvis and in the third part i will talk about trial of vaginal delivery for borderline contracted pelvis for further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology refer to the following books written by me practical obstetrics and gynecology fifth edition modern obstetrics second edition modern gynecology second edition clinical cases in obstetrics questions and answers second edition clinical cases in gynecology questions and answers second edition and pelvic reconstructive surgery If you have found this video useful and informative please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here